Okay, well, uh, today we're going to continue to see how to execute programs, machine language programs, with the PEP9 system. And you have a homework assignment that's due today to add three numbers and output them. So let me go over this figure 4.36 and show you how it works, and then I'll show you exactly how to do your program for. So we'll take questions on the homework a bit later. Okay, now, so in figure 4.36, this program adds 5 plus 3 and outputs 8. <laughs> so it's a very complicated program. It does this, this higher math. Adds two one-digit numbers and gets another one-digit number and it outputs it. But it's really, I mean, uh, it, uh, it, it's kind of excruciating how the machine has to, what the machine has to do in order to do this. And let me just pause here a minute and say, um, if you did not get your last machine language program to work that outputs, you know, the your the letters of your name, you really need to go back and get get those programs to work because if you don't understand how the von Neumann cycle works and how to write that machine language program, then everything else that we do from now on depends on you knowing how to do that. So it's really crucial here in the beginning to get all these details down. I encourage you, if you did not get that program to work, that you, I gave you some hints, I gave you some guidance, I think, on the ones that didn't get it. You need to go, you need to get those programs to work to understand how the machine works. Because remember, the only thing a machine does is what? What's the cycle? Fetch. Decode. Increment. Execute. And repeat. That's all it does. And you have to understand how it does that on each step with these really short machine language programs to understand what's going to happen at the higher levels of abstraction. If you don't get this, everything else that we do is not going to make sense. So we've got, you've got to I encourage you to get those programs to work. Now, so, and so this is another example of a program where we just, we execute one machine language statement after another one and each time it just sends something somewhere and does a computation and puts it somewhere and then outputs what we needed to output. All right? So let's take a look at this figure 4.36. We have two versions of it. The top version in this slide is the machine language version and the bottom version is written in hex. Is the same uh, program written in hex. Now, let's take, so let's take a look at the program written in hex at the bottom part of the screen. Do you see there that there are four instructions, four machine language instructions followed by stop? And stop is zero, zero. So we know that one by now, right? And then after the stop, we have these numbers that we want to add. And the, anytime you do an addition in PEP9, it's two bytes, 16 bits. So does everybody understand what we have there for decimal five? Where is decimal five stored in memory according to that listing? Where is it stored? 000D. Does everybody understand that? And do you see the machine language version of that? Do you see why that's five up there? Zero, 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 one, zero, one. That's the integer five in binary. Is everybody clear on that? And now how do we store the decimal three? Where is decimal three stored? What memory address is decimal three stored? Zero, 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 F. And does everybody see that why that at 000F in binary it's 000000000000011. Question. So would 5 and 3 be considered to start being stored at like 000D, but is it also stored at, is 5 also stored at 000E? That is such a good point, and I'm going to repeat that to make sure everybody gets it. Notice that the 5 that the leading 0, 0 of the 5 is stored at 0, 0, 0, D, but actually the 0, 5, the second half, is actually stored at what location? 0, 0, 0, E. Now, does everybody see that? Is everybody clear on that? On, what, on how to read this machine language listing? 
and how each byte has, a, has an address, which means that the three is actually stored at 000F and 000E. Sorry, E, F, G, oh no. Uh, wait, what's the, where's the 03 stored? 0010, yeah. Now, is everybody clear? That was a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So they're stored in both locations. It's like kind of you see them as the same thing. Yeah. And so what happens is when the ad when when you do a load word, and you tell it what address to load it from, it actually takes you're giving it the first byte. You're giving it the address of the first byte to load, but then it also loads the one next to it, because the accumulator is two bytes. Now, is that clear? Yeah. So do you see, which brings us to the next, to our first instruction. Now, do you see that the first instruction in machine language, hex, is C1000D. Now, if you look at the C, and do you see in machine language, what's the C1? In machine language, what, what is the C1 written in binary? 1100001. That's the C, is everybody with me on that? And if you go back and decode that and you look up in the table, that is the load word instruction. And the register R field is what? Can you tell from that? Do you remember how the register, what's the register R field? Is it one or zero? zero. It's zero, which means load the what? Accumulator. Is everybody clear on that? All right. And now what about the 61000F? What is the 61? That is 01100001. And what do you suppose that is? That's the add instruction. So if you look that up in the opcode, that's the add. Are you with me? Oh, and by the way, let's go back to the first one. What does the first instruction do? It's load the accumulator from what address? 000D. But what is that 000D? That's the decimal 5. Do you, so do you see that all those bits get loaded into the accumulator? Then the add instruction adds what? From what location? 000F. But what is at 000F? The decimal 3. So what does that do? That adds the 5 plus 3. What's 5 plus 3? 8. And where does it put the result? in the accumulator. So after that point, the accumulator has eight in it. Are you with me? Now, here's the point of this program. We cannot now simply output the eight. Why not? Because we need to output an ASCII character. Are you with me? So at, do you, does everybody see that after the addition, what's going to be in the accumulator? In the accumulator, after the addition, it will be it will be the it will be the binary for eight. Now, what is that? That there's 16 bits. So, what would that be? One zero zero zero. Now, does everybody see that? That's what will be in the accumulator after that addition. Question. Um, so that's why we use C1 for load word instead of C14 for load byte. Yes, that's a good question. Notice that what we're doing is we're loading word. The reason is because there is no is because when you do add, you add a complete. You, there is no add byte instruction in the instruction set. You add words, so all of our arithmetic operations and logical operations are all done on 16-bit quantities, and that's why we store everything as a 16-bit quantity. You see, because we add 16-bit quantities. Is everybody clear? Okay, so that's is everybody. So does everybody see that this is what's going to be in the accumulator after we do that addition? But now look, you guys, let's go to the ASCII chart. Here is the ASCII chart. Now in order for, in order for the output to come out correctly, what do we need to output? The what? What do we need to output? Here's on the ASCII chart, what do we need to output? The what? The character eight. So, now let's take a look at that character. Let's take a look at, at the character eight. Is there an operation that will do that? Well, now that's what we have to figure out. Do you see, according to this ASCII chart, that what is the character zero? Here, let's let's just write a few of them down. What is the character zero? It's what. 
Yeah, it's it's zero one one zero 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 zero. And what is the that that's the character zero? What is the character one? Zero zero. Uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. What is the character 2? 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, etc. Right? Does everybody see what's going on here? So here's the thing. Here's the thing. What we need to do is whatever numeric value that we have, so what we need to do is we need to convert from the numeric value to the ASCII character value. So that's what we need to do. So convert from numeric to ASCII. Now tell me, what is the difference between the numeric and the ASCII? Because look, if you just look at this part of it, this is 0, 1, 2. So, but the numeric value has what? All, what, what? What do we have in the accumulator? All zeros. So tell me, what do you have to do, in, in binary, what do you have to do to convert a numeric value to its equivalent ASCII value? You have to insert what? What do you have to stick in there? You have you have to stick in what? One one. Do you see? Does everybody see what you have to do? You have to stick it. You have to you have to insert this one at this position. You have to stick in a one one at this position to convert it. So look, here's how you do this in binary. The way you do this in binary is let's say you have the number. Let's just say you have the number um, the digit. Um, what is the digit? Uh, Five. Let's, let's, let's convert five. What's the digit five? The digit five would be stored how? So here is, this is numeric five. So what would that, how would that be stored in binary? Zero, 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 then what? Zero, one, zero, one, right? And to get the character out of that, what do you have to do? You got to make these two, the, you got to make these two ones. So watch. Here's what we do. We have a mask. And here's our mask. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And what do we do with this? What is this is called masking in binary? And what do we do with this? What what do we do with this mask value? to convert it from here. What operation do we do? What operation do we do that will bring everything down unchanged but that will stick these ones in here? Well, yeah, don't do addition. Add will, addition will work, but that's not the way you would do it. It's OR. Because zero is the what of OR? Zero is the identity of OR. So zero OR anything will just bring this down. But one or anything is what? One. So does everybody see if you do this or operation, this will be zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, zero, one. And at that point, what will happen? This will be the, the correct character that we can output with a store byte to the output device. Now, is everybody, does everybody see how that worked? So now let's go back to figure 4.36. So check it out, you guys. What do you suppose that F, oh, first of all, where is our mask? What does it say, what does it say our mask is? It says mask for the ASCII character. What is that? 0, 0, 3, 0. Now, do you, does everybody see that that's 0, 0, 3, 0? Now, is everybody clear on that? You see where that comes from? See, we're bit twiddling here. We got to know how the, you got to understand what happens at the binary level. This bit twiddling. Are we good? 
So there's our 0, 0, 3, 0. We OR that with this, and that converts our this will convert the decimal 5 to the, to the ASCII 5. Of course, in our program, it'll, be the, it'll convert the decimal 8 to the what? To the ASCII 8. If whatever result it is, it'll convert the decimal to the ASCII. Does everybody see how that works? So now, what is the instruction 910011? What is that 9? If you look at the binary for that, what's the 9? 1001000. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Now, what do you suppose 1001 zero, zero, one is if you look that up? That's what instruction do you suppose? That's the OR instruction. So it's ORing from what memory location? 0011. Zero, zero, one, one. And so that's what does this. And then we output the 8, uh, and that's just a F1. Now, you guys know F1 by now, right? F1 is the store byte instruction, and you store it to the, and the output device is wired in at FC16. Does that look familiar? And then that 8 comes out. Is everybody good? Okay, now, uh, let's, now let's do a demo. And I think you'll, we'll be able to see each step. Okay, so here's our demo, and we're going to do, that was 436, right? So we come here, figure 436, here's the program, there's the C1000D, the decimal 5 and the 3, we copy to object, and now let's do, let's take a look at the memory panel here, and let's single step through this, so we'll go to build, and we'll do start debugging object. All right. Now check it out, you guys. Here's the C1000. Now, what did that instruction do? C1000D. Let load the accumulator. So the five. So the five should be should come into the accumulator. So let's see if that's what happened. Yep. There's the five. And now what does this one do? Three. Oh yeah. It's zero zero here and then zero three here. So then if we add that, that. It gets what in the accumulator? Eight. But now what now what does now what do we have to do? What is this nine one zero zero one one? That converts it to a see that converts it to a character. So if we single step this through, now you see it's fifty six decimal, but look on our little byte calculator here, sure enough, fifty six is the character eight. So everybody you see how that works? And so then when we, when we output that, the 8 comes out, and then we're done. Okay, okay so now here's a, a tip on how to, do your own, how to do your homework. You understand that you're, if you're going to add three numbers, what's going to happen? You're going to have an extra, yeah, you're going to have an extra instruction. That means that those three numbers are going to be stored not starting at location 000D. It's going to be stored somewhere else. Farther, farther down. So what will you do? You'll load the accumulator, then you'll, with, of the first number, you'll add the second number, which is the negative 3, which you need to store in hex as a negative 3, and then you need to add the third number, and then convert that to the ASCII, and then output it, and then stop. But now your numbers are going to be at a different location, so you're going to have to count down and know where to load them from. See, that that aspect, that's also what you had to do to output your name, the letters of your name. You needed to be able to count down to see where those letters of your name were stored after the stop instruction. Does everybody see how this, how this works? Th this is just super basic what you need to know how to do with a machine language program so, so that all this other stuff that comes later at the higher levels of abstraction will make sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah, for now, let's just use the, you could do this in the index register, but for now, let's just always use the accumulator. Is, it, is the index register like um, for specific jobs? Just for the, the index register is for arrays, okay. and we're not dealing with arrays, and that's just by convention, mm -hmm. but, and so you could use the index register, but let's not. Okay. Yeah. But, that you're, but you're right, These, you could load the index register, add the index register, yeah, and then, then output from the, the character, yeah. But, but you, that, that is, that, the machine will work. You might want to try that, but yeah. do it with the accumulator. Okay. All right, does everybody, now does everybody see how to do the homework? Yeah, now, now you guys, do you see a potential 
difficulty with this converting, having to convert to ASCII like this? What, what's, do you see a, do you see a... Besides, it takes a memory. Well, no. What happens if the sun is, sum is bigger than nine? What would you have to do? A in machine language at this level, what would you have to do? You would have to figure out, because like, what if the result was like, uh, you know, like 13? Well, then the 13 would be all in these last four bits. And you would have to, be, what would you have to output? The character 1 followed by the what? The character 3. You couldn't use this technique. This is limited to one-digit answers. Whoa! What are we going to do? <laughs> All semester long, are we going to have to <laughs> deal with just one-digit numbers, one-digit results? Fortunately, at a higher level of abstraction, we'll see how we can, uh, what, what it's going to take to do that. But you have to understand, if the, if the machine, the machine uh, th that kind of thing, that kind of problem is never solved in the hardware. The hardware does not have the capability to solve that problem. Are you with me? So that's why, we, that's why it is really instructive to, to be programming at the machine level, to see how limited it is. Okay? Now, this next one program is also uh, very instructive. Okay, it's in figure 4.37. <laughs> now look, can you just tell me right off the bat what figure 4.37 does? <laughs> All that binary, you'd have to go through the code and you know figure out decode, you know. But here, in another, the second half of Figure 4.37 on this next slide, I have it written out in hex and with some comments. All right, and this, you guys uh, know that one big problem with the internet is viruses. Okay. This is an example of a self-modifying program. Viruses modify your programs on your computer when you get them. They, they literally change your programs. This illustrates that phenomenon in a von Neumann machine. Okay, so this is a self-modifying program. This shows that with the von Neumann cycle, it is possible to have a, have a program modify itself. Now let's analyze this figure 4.37 before we do the demo. For right now, for the next few minutes, let's ignore the first two statements. The first two machine language statements. The statements that are at 0000 and 0003. For a minute, let's just ignore them, all right? And let's just take a look at the rest of the program. Now, what is C10013? Do you remember what C1 was from the previous program? That was, it was load the accumulator, load, word, load a word from the accumulator. It was load word, right? So what does this say? C10013, this says load from 0013. Well, let's go down to 0013. What is at 0013? 0005. Yeah, the decimal five. So what does that statement look like it's doing? It's loading five into the accumulator. All right. Now, what, do you remember what is 610015? Do you remember what 61 was from the previous? That was add. This looks like it's doing what? Adding what? Now, what's at 0015? A decimal three. So it looks like it's adding the three. So it looks like what should be in the accumulator. It looks like H should be in the accumulator, right? According to our analysis so far, all right? And then, what is the next instruction Z uh, at 0, 0, 0, C? It's 910017. That's convert the sum to a character. Now, what is that 0017? That's our what? That's our, it's the same mask as before. Are we good? So it looks like that should convert the numeric 8 to the character 8, and then F1, FC16 outputs the character. It looks like an 8 should come out, right? But an 8 doesn't come out. According to this, what comes out? A 2. What the heck?
a 2 is coming out, not an 8. What in the world is going on? Well, now let's go back and take a look at those first two instructions. D10019. D1. Do you have your. Does anybody have the book? Can you look up D1? Well, actually, I have it here <laughs> in, the, in the comment. What is it doing? Load. It's load byte accumulator from what memory location? Zero, zero, 001. Well, what is at 0019? 71. Seven. Now, if you go back up here and look at it in binary, the 71, do you see that's 0111, so does everybody agree that that load byte puts that in the right half of the accumulator? Are you with me? Now, what's the next instruction? Store byte accumulator. So now it's going to put it somewhere. But look, where does it put it? At zero, zero, what? Zero, nine. What the heck? What is at? Zero, 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 0009. That is... Wait, what is it? That's that add instruction. Do you see what it did? It changed the add instruction to us. Yeah, if you look up, uh, if you look up uh, 71, 71 is... Zero, 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 whoops. What was seven, one? Zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one. If you look this up, what, is, what do you suppose this is? This is the subtract instruction, register specifier zero, which is the accumulator. Zero, zero, one, which is what? What does this mean? Zero, zero, one is the what? Direct addressing. So what is that doing? That's changing the con that's changing the instruction. So when it gets down there, it so 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 after it does load byte, store byte, A gets the first number. Now what now it's not adding the two numbers anymore. What's it doing? It's subtracting them. And what is 5 minus 3? 2. Now does everybody see how that works? Now watch this, you guys. This is, the, this is a really slick feature of the um, PEP9 app. Okay, so now here is our, here's our demo. We're going to go to figure 437 and put that in. Figure 437. We're going to copy this to object. And so here's figure 437. So there's the D10019, F10009, and so on, etc. And now watch this, we'll do a build, start debugging object. Now, check out this memory dump, sports fans. This D10019, what does that do? What did we say that did? Load byte accumulator. So let's single step and see if it, what, what it did. And sure enough, in the accumulator there's this 0071, right? And now, what was this F10009? Store, store, but where is it going to put it? Zero, 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 zero. Where is 0009? Right here, I think. Is that right? Now watch this. Boom! Did you see it change? It changed. Even though in our original listing it says it's something, now after the program executes well, it's not what, we, what it was at the beginning. Because what is, this, what is the von Neumann cycle? Fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. That's all it's doing. So, hey, yeah, question? And it, it, that honestly could have been anything in there that it's replacing. Because it's not adding or anything. It's just like straight up replacing it, right? It's straight out replacing it. Yeah. When you do a store, the original content is destroyed and whatever gets put in there gets written over it. And by the way, it took a copy from the accumulator. Notice that the accumulator still has the 0071. And this, and I programmed, this was just a program to illustrate that I could have changed it to another one, you know.
do a different instruction or whatever. Does everybody see that? That that's what happened? And so now, and so now, now what, what is this next instruction? C10013, what does that do? Well, what did that do? Load, Lo load the accumulator with what? The, yeah, and which one? Yeah, yeah, so, so that puts the five in the accumulator, right? Is everybody clear? But now look! The, the von Neumann cycle, it has a 7-1 there. It doesn't know that it was changed. It just does what? Fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. It fetches it. Whatever it is, it's in the hardware to decode it the way it's, and if it's a 7-1, that's a subtract instruction. The hardware has no concept of where those bits came from. There's no history. Does everybody see that? This is super important computer system principle. Are we good? Okay, so here, so then, so now when we see equals step, what's gonna happen? It does the subtract, and that's the two, and then it changes it to the ASCII two, and out comes the two, and then we stop. Now, does everybody see how that works? So this is what viruses do. They come in, they know where your instructions are, they modify the instructions so that then when it happens, it's a branch instruction to the virus code and they take over and then they jump back. And, but th they can do it. Why is that? Because these, all these machines are von Neumann machines and they are, they are built on fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. Okay, so now are there any questions about that? about how that, how that happens. And I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat right now, um, on the next exam or two, I'm gonna give you self-modifying programs and so you're gonna have to be able to figure out, trace, you know, that's a favorite, I just, it's just a favorite question, so I'll just tell you right off the bat. I, I just love giving these kinds of questions because, because you have to be able to figure out how it gets modified and what it gets modified to and do the decode, so you gotta be able to think like a, think like a machine. Yeah? Okay, now are there any questions about any of this stuff so far? About the homework, about how to do the homework? Okay. Or the self-modifying program. Okay, so now um, the next few slides here, we're going to wrap up today by showing you some real world, some real physical machines. Now, um, I think everybody in here who has a laptop, whether it's Windows or Mac or whatever, they, all these laptops, they virtually all have a, an Intel chip or, a, or an Intel compatible chip. And the, uh, also all desktop machines are usually, 90% of them are, are Intel chips. And the particular chip is called the Intel X80, X86. And the X86 architecture is, um, it stands for a whole series of CPUs that were originally designed by Intel, starting with the 8086 and the 8286 and the 8386 and the 46 and the Pentium, and now it's called Core. And this whole family of this whole family of uh, chips that were uh, that are designed by Intel, they have all evolved over de many decades, and. So here is, and so what I would like to do is show you some of the features of the x86 chip, and which is what you're running now, and compare it with, so we can compare it with PEP9. So here in figure 4.38 is a picture of a 32-bit model of, from the x86 architecture, okay? And one, one of the things that uh, you should notice right off the bat is that the registers are 32 bits long. So in PEP9, how big is, a reg how big is the, how long is the accumulator, how long is the index register in PEP9? How many bits? Six. Two bytes, which is 16, 16 bits. bits. So this is 32, so th these are like twice as long. Are you with me? Now in the early days, they, um, the registers were like, well, in the early, early days, the registers were like eight bits. <laughs> but then in the, in the semi-early days, the re for, for, for a long time, personal computers were, had like 16 bits. That was just like PEP9 is now. They were really tiny. And now, uh, and then they expanded, I think, um, to 32 bits. I think with the Pentium 4, that's when they went to 64 bits. 
but each model of the Intel chip was backward compatible with the previous model and so you can run them in, you can run a 64-bit processor in 32-bit mode so that you can run 32-bit legacy software on it. And um, the, so let's take a look at these registers. There are four general purpose registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. So we have one accumulator, X86 has like, these are like four accumulators. Do you see what I mean? So there's more, you know, there's more registers to do stuff with in the X86. The ESI is the, the ESI and the EDI, that I stands for index register. So we have one index register, the X86 has two index registers. So that's, that SI is the source index register and the DI is the destination index register. So it's got, you see, so it's bigger, you know, in a real machine, they got more wider, you know, longer registers, more index registers. Um, what do you suppose the ESP corresponds to? Stack pointer. Yeah, that's the stack pointer. So there's the stack pointer, the SP. And the BP is the base pointer. We don't have a base pointer. That's, you can read about that elsewhere. And the EIP, that IP stands for instruction pointer. That's what they call the program counter. Okay, so that's the EIP. And then the, um, the registers are subdivided into um, into a half, so like if you want to access the right half of EAX, that's the that's AX, and then how how long is how long is AL? How many bits is in AL? Eight. So that's like a byte. That's the right rightmost byte. So you can access some byte commands. You know, put things in the right half byte. Now you'll notice also that there's a difference in the in the numbering convention. Notice that the oh. Well, notice that the, um, the register, the E flags register, how are the bits numbered? Starting from the zero on the right. So that's different from our convention, okay? Our convention is to number them from left to right. Their convention is to number them from right to left. All right, and there's another little complicate. Oh, let me just show you now what about the E, the e flags. So we have four status bits, N, Z, V, and C, shown here in figure 4.39. But um, the Intel chip has a, has a lot more status flags, and the ones that correspond to our N, Z, V, C are called SF, ZF, OF, and CF. SF stands for signed flag, ZF stands for the zero flag, OF stands for the overflow flag, and CF stands for the carry flag. And they actually are in that, they are in these positions. This table shows where they are in this, in this E flags register. They're just, they're scattered. See, they're in there. They're, you gotta, you, that's where they, they store them. As, there's a whole bunch of other ones. It's more complicated. But anyway, there they are. <laughs> you know, that's, their, that's the Intel equivalent of, the, of our NZVC flags. Does everybody see that? And now, uh, there's one more thing that you should probably be, that it would be nice to be aware of. And that is this thing about Little Indian and Big Indian. In figure 4. Point, we skipped over this before earlier, but in figure 4.29 shows the difference between a little Indian CPU and a big Indian CPU. It's, a, it's EAN, right? No, IAN. E-N-D-I-A-N. And then X86 is little Indian. And this has absolutely no fundamental significance at all. This is just a convention. All right. There's nothing to this. This is just a. This is just a, a, a detail that you have to deal with when you're dealing with real machines. You see what I'm saying? So there is no fundamental. I mean, the engineers. They just some engineers when they designed the first chips decades ago, they decided to do it one way, and other engineers decided to do it the other way, and they're incompatible. And you know, 
That's, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is in the real world. All right? So in a little Indian CPU, check this out in figure 4.29. And uh, with a little Indian CPU, in memory, if you have 92EF and you do a load word, what order does it get put in? EF92. Because they start from the right and they go to the left. That, I mean, when you deal with x86, you've got to deal with this. It's a headache. You see, what, you see what we're saying? Okay. And here it's even worse. If you have a, this is the way it is in the Intel chip, a 32-bit register load. In memory, if you have 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, then in a big Indian machine, you'd have 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. But in a little Indian machine, you'd have E, F, C, D, A, B, 8, 9. You see what I mean? And not only that, it's E, F. It's not F, E. You see, so it's, I mean, it, it, but then, then, and then some manufacturers, they would do it all the way down to the bit level backwards, you know, starting from the right. It's just, it's just, not, it's just nonsense to have to deal with that. There's no fun to, and by, by the way, does anybody know what Indian, why they call it Indian? E, it's E-N-D-I-A-N. Gulliver's. Gulliver's Travels, yeah. You know the, about the little Indians and the big Indians? The, the egg, do you crack the egg? Yeah, crack the egg on the big on the, on, the, on the little side or the big side? Do you remember that from Gulliver's Travels? Yeah, so that's, and it's a, it's a good metaphor because, you know, what difference does it make what side you can crack the egg? What difference does it make, you know, it's of no fundamental significance. But anyway, fortunately, we, our PEP9 is a big Indian machine and we don't have to deal with that stuff. And here in figure 4.40 is an example of the x86 add register instructions. So look, it has an opcode, it has a D field, for a D field, an S field, a mod field, a register field, uh, you know, all these fields and you've got to, you, you know, you've got to parse them all out to decode it and figure out what each one means and all that kind of stuff. Here the opcode is 0000000. 000 000 000 000. I think this is the add instruction. Yeah, add register. So this adds the content of one register and puts it and adds it to adds it with, to another register and it puts the content back in one of the registers. So, so anyway, you know, and you can read about this. But I've got some more information about how to decode this instruction in the book, in the little sidebar in the book. Okay. So now, um, a few words about memory devices. Um, there are, there's two kinds of memory. There's read-write memory and then there's read-only memory. Okay, have you, you guys know, have you heard of ROM and RAM? Most people have heard about ROM and RAM. So the thing about read-only memory is that it has to do with loads and stores. So what happens is if you have a read-only memory chip wired into your memory system and you, and you do a store, then now stores from what to what? CPU to memory or memory to CPU? CPU to memory. CPU to memory. So if you, do, if you have a value in the accumulator and you store it to ROM, what happens is the, the storage in ROM doesn't change. You can, you can go ahead and execute the instruction, but, the, but ROM, to, ROM will not change. You see what, so it's, it's, the difference between ROM and RAM is that, is that if with RAM, if you store it to RAM, it changes the memory, what's in the memory location, but in ROM it does not. So the, the pattern is built, burned into ROM and it's unchangeable. Okay, and here in figure 4.41 <clears throat> is a picture of what is called the memory map. And we can see then that the operating system, the, and this shows where everything is in memory. Okay, now let's end with this. Let's end with this, let's end with this review. What is the C memory model? Uh-oh, have we already forgotten the C memory model? Come on. <laughs> what is stored where? Global variables. Global are stored where? Fixed and a fixed location. location. Look, do you see that fixed location in memory on the memory map? Uh, globals. globals. What was the second one? Local variables. Local variables and Parameters. on the what? Runtime Do you see the runtime stack? Yes. And what was the third one? Dynamically, Dynamically all from the what? Heap. heap. Do you see where the heap is? 
frequency. And not only that, do you see where the input device is? At what memory location? FC1. FC1. And where's the output device? FC16. FC1. And do you see which part is ROM? And which part, the, the, the shaded one, the loader, the trap handler, and all that stuff from memory location, FC17 on down is ROM. Read-only memory, that's burned in. If you do a store to that, it won't change. You can try it. You can try, try it on the PEP9 thing and try, try to do a store and see if it changes it. Yeah? So, um, typically when we run our PEP9 stuff, it just like automatically goes into zero. Okay. Yes, that's automatic. If there was a global variable, <coughs> variable our, our instruction would go after. Yeah, we're, we'll see how to do that. What's going to happen is, here at the beginning, our, our values were after the program, but after we do a few more programs, we'll always put them at the top at a fixed location at the top. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of, that was a good observation. That's coming up. All right, good deal. See you next time.